Might be ready to go. OK, well, good, good morning and welcome to uh, a local hearing in relation to the Cymru uh, flood, flood Protection Scheme 2020. Um, this is a hearing under the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act uh, 2009 into the scheme promoted by Perth and Ross Council. Uh, uh, my name is Paul Coquette. I'm a reporter appointed by Perth and Ross Council. Uh, I work for the Directorate uh, of Planning and Environmental Appeals uh, and I've been appointed um, by the Council uh, to uh, consider an outstanding objection to the scheme and to report um, the findings of this, this hearing uh, to the Council. Uh, the objector is Ms Fiona Smith, uh, who lives at Homer, uh, which is on Commercial Lane uh, in Cymru. Uh, she had lodged an objection following uh, public advertisement of the scheme um, in the course of 2020 uh, and maintains her objection, uh, which gives rise to the need for the hearing um, this morning. Um, uh, the objector is not intending to appear at this hearing herself. Um, she intimated to my office on the 10th of June uh, that she was maintaining her objection and reiterated her objection, but indicated uh, that she was willing to rely on her written objection uh, to um, the scheme. Uh, so we are proceeding uh, on the basis of a hearing this morning. Uh, I'll explain the process of the hearing for those who are watching online uh, in a moment uh, and invite in a second uh, Peter Dixon on behalf of, of Perth uh, uh, and Ross Council to introduce himself and his team who are who are present this morning. Um, this hearing is being broadcast live um, uh, thanks to Perth and Ross Council uh, so that any members of the public who are watching are welcome uh, and I hope they find it useful um, uh, to see events this morning, but obviously we'll be able to watch only um, on a, 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 a website and therefore not be able to participate uh, in the uh, hearing itself. The um, In the course of the hearing um, this morning, uh, it's, it's likely that parties, including myself, will refer to various documents that have been prepared primarily by uh, Perth and Council, but also SWECO uh, in relation to the scheme. Um, uh, we will be mindful of members of the public who will be watching uh, to try to make proceedings as understandable as we can for those who are who are watching. Uh, all those documents are available uh, on a, a website, which I think uh, will appear at some point on the screen uh, for those um, who wish to look at the documents, whether the documents we're referring to at any one time um, or otherwise, uh, to get a better sense of the um, the uh, questions arising and the answers given to them. The documents can be found at www.pkc.gov.uk forward slash article forward slash 21568 forward slash Combray dash flood dash protection dash scheme dash documents uh, for those who wish to, to access uh, access those. Uh, the, the process this morning and the procedure that we're proceeding by is by way of a public hearing, which has been done obviously virtually because of COVID restrictions. Uh, it's not a public local inquiry, um, which would involve parties represented uh, and being able to formally um, question and cross examine witnesses for other parties to the inquiry. Uh, um, and uh, make uh, representations often uh, represented by lawyers, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, that's not the process for this morning. A hearing uh, is uh, intended as a more focused discussion, uh, which I, the reporter, um, will lead questions um, and will ask various questions that have come to my mind arising from the documents that have been lodged by parties in relation uh, to the scheme uh, and in relation to the objections made uh, by the objector. Had she been here, uh, any questions she might have had would have been channeled through myself as, as part of that hearing process. Um, I've read all the papers that have been provided, including all the letter uh, 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 letters to the objector um, and considered her uh, initial objection 18th March last year and a series of emails that uh, email exchanges with the council in the period after that uh, and as I say most recently uh, the objector wrote to this office on 10th of June um, reiterating her objection and I've had regard to that document as well. Uh, I paid a visit to the site, I went to look at the site uh, on the 22nd of May uh, to familiarise myself uh, rather more closely with the, um, the proposals under, un under the scheme. Uh, Perth Cross Council have lodged a statement of case and a scheme justification uh, in relation to the um, uh, the scheme uh, documents that um, uh, can be seen 
under the reference that I gave uh, earlier on, um, and I, our, our representative this morning, I think, being their, their, their team leader this morning, Peter Dixon, um, and uh, I'd like to ask him to introduce his, his, his team members. When we uh, when I ask questions, um, uh, I do have a note of the prospective professional qualifications of a number, if not all, of the, the members of the, um, the, the Perth and Ross team uh, this morning, but any question that I ask um, uh, uh, council officials or, or, or SWECO um, employees should simply feel free, whoever is most appropriately qualified to answer the question, just feel free to answer those questions and others can, can chip in uh, if they want to complement that. But if I can maybe invite uh, Mr Dixon uh, just to introduce the uh, officials and employees of with him this morning. Thank you. Thanks Paul. Thanks, Paul. Oh, can do that. Thank you. There. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Peter Dixon. I'm the senior engineer with Perth and Cross Council's flooding team. Uh, now, on the call this morning, we've also got Craig McQueen, who's an engineer with our team, and Elliot Williamson, who's a technician with our team. And um, obviously, in the development of the Cormier Flood Scheme, we've been working with Swaco. Uh, who providing the, the council with the technical advice on the scheme. Uh, from Swaco, we've got Ian Goldie, who's a director uh, with the Highways Division in Scotland Ireland. Uh, we have Rebecca McLean, who's the technical director, advisory and planning with Swaco, and Gail Curry, who's principal consultant, uh, advisory and planning with Swaco as well. Uh, so hopefully that's the whole team. And I was just going to go into my sort of introduction, Paul, if that's okay. Yes, of course, please feel free. Yep. That sounds nice. uh, just to talk briefly about the scheme itself and uh, I'm going to talk just a few short words about the sort of purpose of the scheme, uh, the environmental impact assessment has been done and some of the public consultation that, that we've undergone to, to arrive at this uh, position. Uh, so Cormor itself is located uh, at the confluence of three large rivers, the Water Rookal, the River Lern and the River Lednock. And there's been a history of flooding within the town and within the Dalgan Ross area uh, in particular. The last significant flood in the town was, was back in 2012 when we had two large separate flood events. The first in August that year affected the proper, uh, approximately 60 properties and the second flood in November of that year uh, affected approximately 150 properties. So the local community has never been badly affected by flooding in the past. And uh, the council at that time, we went and implemented some emergency flood protection works on the Water Rookal. Uh, however, the wider flood risk from the River Lern and the River Lednock still remains, as does the combined flood risk from all three rivers in the area. Uh, we carried out extensive flood study work uh, and, and hydraulic modelling work, and this has been used to investigate the potential options for managing that, that identified flood risk in the area. Uh, and to consider the various technical, environmental and economic issues involved in implementing a flood scheme. Uh, so that work has confirmed that a flood scheme is feasible uh, and has resulted in properties, uh, sorry, for, in proposals for flood defence walls and embankments in the area. Uh, and those form the, the scheme that we, the council published. Uh, the, the scheme is intended to protect 189 properties, has a benefit cost ratio of 1.38 and will also deliver various environmental benefits. Uh, the scheme itself forms a key part of the uh, published T flood risk management strategy and local flood risk management plan. Uh, the scheme is located within a potentially vulnerable area designated for due to flood risk and it's included in the national priority list of flood schemes and funding is in place. And full council took a preliminary decision to confirm the proposed scheme without modification on 24th of June 2020 last year. In terms of the, the EIA work, uh, scheme is subject to environmental impact assessment uh, and an EIA report has been published. Uh, the EIA undertaken for the scheme provides an assessment of all potential construction and operational impacts, which may result uh, due to the proposed scheme and adequately assesses the effects these may have on the environment. Uh, we've got appropriate mitigation measures uh, embedded into the design solution. Uh, so that any negative effects are reduced, managed or minimised as far as possible. Uh, when impacts remain, additional mitigation has been recommended. Environmental enhancement and community benefits have also been uh, included where possible. Uh, and just to sort of finalise a few words about the consultation process that we've undergone, uh, that's been fairly extensive. Uh, uh, consultation carried out in the proposed scheme, uh, with the matter before us today being the only outstanding ob objection. Uh, 
various consultation activities have taken place, individual meetings and discussions have been held with interest groups and landowners. A dedicated web page was set up some time ago and community newsletters were issued uh, at key stages during the project uh, to the community. Uh, the recommended flood scheme and the alternative options that were considered were put to public consultation back in September 2016 and updated proposals for the preferred scheme were subject to further consultation at a local public exhibition held in April and May 2019. Uh, the Council subsequently published a Q&A document af after the 2016 uh, consultation that, that went out in, in December 16 that year and a public consultation report for the, the main exhibition was published in November 2019. Uh, details from all these consultation events can still be viewed on the Council's website. Uh, the proposals were amended uh, to address most of the concerns raised by the community during the publication, uh, sorry, uh, prior to the publication of the notices for the flood scheme on 28 February 2020 under the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act. And in general, the response from the community and key stakeholders to the recommended scheme was positive, uh, and obviously their responses will continue to inform the future detailed design and development of the proposals for the flood scheme going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I just ask actually one slightly preliminary question actually of Sweeko as well? I wonder if somebody from Sweeko can just just explain what their um, their kind of um, uh, organisation is and does. Uh, I, um, I get the impression that you're civil engineers and you're commissioned by the council, but I wonder if you just want to say a little bit about your professional background. I know you did the work with the EIA, uh, just so I can understand the professional qualifications and the nature of the business of Sweeko. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I, I can pick that up if that's OK. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, um, basically, um, SWECO are consulting engineers and uh, we were engaged by uh, Perth and Kinross Council to take uh, take forward the previous work that had been done by uh, Michelle consultants once they had identified that a flood prevention scheme was feasible. So we then um, proceeded um, to, to do further work to look at uh, what we call an outline design for the scheme to see, to effectively put those feasibility uh, proposals into a workable scheme, although not fully detailed design uh, level of detail. Um, so we came up with an outline design scheme um, and worked hand in glove with uh, the council in terms of um, you know, assisting and producing the material for the public consultation events um, and supporting and um, discussions with uh, landowners and householders etc um, to refine the scheme as required um, till we got to the, the final outline design and at that stage um, Becky and, and Gail um, who are on the call today uh, undertook the environmental impact assessment uh, on the scheme to, to examine the scheme's uh, impact on the surrounding areas and the environment and the landscape etc um, and from that point we produced um, the various documents their various engineering documents to support the submission for the flood protection order, uh, the environmental impact assessment being one of them. Does that answer you? Yeah, that's questions? fine. Thank you. That's all great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I want to thank you just ask, I think this might be addressed to Mr. Dixon, um, just a couple of sort of dates questions um, just to uh, to double check my understanding uh, of the the chronology in in this, um, this uh, batch is proceeding to a hearing because I think under the legislation, um, the scheme with an objection is referred to Scottish ministers who consider whether to go to the holding a full public inquiry. I wonder if you could just confirm the date in which ministers decided not to proceed with the full PLI, which therefore led to this uh, this hearing. Um, if you have that information right now, fine. But if if you have to come back to me on that, that. Would fine as well but you just confirmed the, the the date the ministers intimated to the council that they were, they were not seeking not requiring this to go by to a hearing to that to a, to a yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think we got a uh, confirmation of that back in the autumn now i don't have the precise date to hand i'm hoping maybe craig mcqueen can help me out i think the the final email from scottish government came through i think it was 18th of january that's okay. the date. Yeah, that's um, so yeah 
Yeah, um, I'll take that as 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 the the, the, the just now. You don't have to confirm, but if if at the end of the day your 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 memory is um is, has 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 misremembered that slightly, you can let me know. But I'll take that as the date um uh, for the purposes of, of my report, which is fine. The second date question is um I I I've noted um what Peter Dixon was saying about the twenty fourth of June twenty twenty as the date I think of the adoption on a preliminary basis subject to this, and I'd seen also a report to a committee in twenty seventeen uh, was there a date at which the full council um, effectively adopted or decided to proceed with the scheme? Is that the 2017 date or was there a committee a committee consideration between 2017 and then the after all the work had been done, the decision of June 2020 to proceed? Again, it's just the date of that if you happen to know it. Yeah, I think yeah. The, the formal uh, preliminary decision taken by full council, Paul, was, was 24th of June 2020 last year. Um, so that was what led to the, the current process that we're in. So the 2017 report was just a, a previous kind of update that we did to committee following the sort of end of the feasibility phase and the public consultation on that, which I think the decision taken at that point was about the type of scheme that we would be okay. promoting. So it wasn't about, you know, flood storage areas or reservoirs. It was about a scheme within Comrie uh, okay. looking at walls and embankments, basically. That was the decision taken at that okay. point. No, that's helpful. Uh, and the second, uh, third question, if you happen to know, uh, if you happen to know, I know there was two objections at one point, the second of which was withdrawn. Do you know um, uh, what the date of withdrawal of the second objection was? Uh, I'm going to have to ask Craig again. Yes, uh, if you can me out on that one. Uh, 27th of March, that this, like 2021. It. Fantastic. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you for that. OK, moving on to the, the consultation, and you mentioned a little bit about the, um, the, the the consultation issues in relation to that. The first is just a factual one from, from my understanding. I see with the uh, uh, the, the scheme um, details on the website, there, there was a, a full report and a short report uh, on the consultation that was undertaken. Uh, in the full report, uh, that sets out obviously all the objections. Um, it looks to me, Mr Dixon, that um, uh, the objectors uh, issues in that relation. She's treated as objector number 42, which is on page 55 of that document. Um, I wonder if, again, you don't have to do it right now, you can come back in the course of the hearing later on. Uh, if you, uh, you just maybe confirm to me um, if, if, if that is indeed the response to that objector, um, and if not, just to confirm that, just so I can, I can, I can link up uh, where um, on that document the, uh, the objection from Fiona Smith is. Um, for that that full question, um, the, the, the oh, sorry, 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 Paul, yeah. if I can just jump in there. Um, I think that uh, my understanding of that report is that was all those objections, those numbered objections you see at the back of that report. Although they're not technically objections, they were yeah. based on comment forms from the public consultation right, okay. events. Yes, and I don't think Miss Smith attended the. Public consultation ah, right, okay. or submitted a form at that time, so that, yes. that, that must be oh, a separate. That. It must look similar, but yeah, it will okay. be a separate person. I can confirm who that is for you. No, I, I don't need to know who it is particularly. I, I just, as I say, it looked like it was like her objection, but wasn't didn't quite match up with what she said. But now you're mentioning it, I think I'd seen from papers that she'd been unable to attend the consultation events in April and May, uh, and there'd been a previous meeting with her. So that actually makes sense um, if if those relates to other comments rather than her. So thank you, thank you for that. That's very useful. I think we, um, in, those, in those reports, Paul, we do try and uh, anonymise any comments indeed. that the council receives. And a lot of them come, you know, at the sort of public exhibition that we held because uh, yeah. people fill out comment forms and, and the like. Yeah. And it's really uh, the aim of that is to get at what the issues are. Um, but yeah, we can certainly dig into that and find out who, who, who gave us those comments. We do have those records. Yeah. No, that's fine. I just need to know if, it, if it's not the particular objection, I don't need to know who it is for the reasons you've just said, but that's been very helpful just to uh, to get to uh, help my understanding uh, of how she'd expressed her objection to that. Um, and the, the, the kind of related question on, on the consultation, uh, which ties into that, is um, um, as to whether you're aware uh, of whether there were any kind of any engagement or any consultation with other owners along, along the kind of the commercial lane um, 
properties, the bit between Commercial Lane and Ancaster Lane, I'm thinking of the lines East Riverside, Ern Moor, um, and the other properties that are, are, are along that. Uh, obviously, they didn't object, and, and I know uh, Craig had mentioned there that I, I, an important distinction between making representations and objecting, um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it that there weren't anything significant coming from the owners of any of those other properties, uh, particularly the properties at Ern Moor, which I'll come to a bit later on, um, but the property that run uh, between Commercial Lane and Ancaster Lane. I think there was consultation with them, Paul. We, we did put yeah. in quite a big effort. Yeah. To no, so I, I saw that I saw that all, they were all on the list of consultees. Yeah. And, uh, so yes, I'm, I'm satisfied they were all consulted. I was just wondering whether you, it, it's possible to kind of summarise what the kind of the the, the essence of, of any any representations they made were. Um, I think, yeah, I think most of the comments from them were around the sort of access issues that um, you know is also the, the subject of Mrs. Smith's ob objection. Um, and that's why you know, the scheme was really developed to, to take account of those sort of local concerns uh, where people had uh, this issue of the flood wall suddenly been, been implemented and trying to get access through it or over it. So, you know, we've ended okay. up with proposals for these access steps, which are just a bit further east than, than commercial lane, sure. uh, with lockable gates and things like that to give people access to the, the garden ground, yeah. uh, which would then be on the far side of the flood wall. So, yeah, there's quite a lot of discussions with those yes. residents about that. Uh, and I think they were resolved. Yeah, there's been um, quite a lot of individual meetings, as you can imagine, Paul, with uh, landowners yeah. along that stretch. So the owners at Ern Moor, for instance, um, they at one point had a motorhome which they had a certain parking area set aside for. So one of the key considerations for them was would they have that space available once the flood scheme was right. complete? Yeah. So we've managed to include things like that within the design. Um, and then properties further east along towards Ancaster Lane, um, such as at the Limes and East Riverside, we've included yes. those private stairways, mm. uh, that kind of double step arrangement, that's what that's been included for for them to make sure they've got access to their garden ground, again, following yeah. construction of the scheme. Um, so yeah, we have had individual meetings with them, we've tried to adapt and include for them in the design where possible. No, OK, that, that's helpful. Uh, I mean, the reason the reason I was asking that, we'll come to the title situation in a minute, um, but um, the reason I was asking that is I saw on the um, the full report on the consultation that we've referred to already, um, there was a reference to some of the issues being quite tricky and quite troublesome uh, and a matter of local concern in the area more generally. There was, it was a reference to complexity of title issues, but also um, a bit of the, of, of, of the general complexity was arising there because of the need to accommodate the, 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 the different concerns of different residents there. So that's that's helpful. Uh, that's helpful from that, that perspective. Um, on a linked question with that, I'm going to come, we'll come shortly to the specific objections from um, from Fiona Smith, but one of them, uh, one of the sets of objections was around the sort of the wider nature of consultation and she do parallels with the kind of planning, um, the planning context. Um, obviously, the, the scheme has a, a, a wider impact um, than any one house. It's, uh, it covers quite a, a significant area. Um, but I take it though, um, in terms of the kind of weight that the council would give to um, individual objectors, uh, that you, you would give a kind of, if you like, an enhanced weight um, if, it's an, if, if, if it's an objection which relates to the individual property owned by any one objector. So you wouldn't, I presume you wouldn't give equal weight to a kind of somebody living halfway across the town um, as to the, uh, compared to the objection that would, the weight would be given to an objection of somebody who's, whose own land is being impacted on. But I don't know if you say anything about the kind of relative weight of objections, just mindful of her point that everybody in the town had an opportunity to comment on her garden effectively. Yeah, Paul, no, um, that's probably true. Yeah, if you've got a landowner who's been directly affected, um, you know, that, that's something that you do want to address. Uh, and I, I know uh, everyone in the team put a lot of effort into, you know, identifying landowners throughout Comrie and then uh, having those one to one discussions with them directly. And that, that was outside of any public exhibition, uh, which obviously they had the chance to, to come in and discuss that with as well. But yes, yeah, you know, somebody who's 
uh, you know, got garden ground or a property within the town directly affected by flood, well, we would probably have a bit more weight than somebody, you know, sort of passing through the town and sort of saying, well, you know, I don't like the way your flood scheme looks as, as they drive past, you know, sure. wouldn't have, have equal weight. So that, that's a fair point, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'd, I'd like to move on now um, to just get a slightly better understanding, and I, I see quite a lot of this in, in the papers, just to the kind of the general kind of usage of that area, which I see is, is, is known locally as the boulevard. Um, um, and um, I, I can see that it's possible to access um, the boulevard, and indeed I did it myself, around the back of the public toilets on the bridge uh, and come down uh, and walk along um, to the, the, the back of the objector's property. And I see that, um, uh, or the impression I get is that, is that the disabled access would go, uh, and improved uh, access for, for disabled users would go around the back of, uh, of, of that property there. Um, the sense I have um, is that there, there, there's um, a reasonable amount of support locally, not only for continued access to the boulevard area, but effectively for what I might describe as a circular access. So that you you go down, you might you might access it through uh, the back of the public toilets and down the, the ramp onto the the riverside, and there's not much going right when you get to the bottom there. But when you go left, um, you, you you cut under the bridge, and then you you go through. Um, so I wonder if you, if you say something about you know, that what 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 the kind of the public feeling was or the consultation feeling was for access to the boulevard, and in particular the kind of the the arguments in favour of having that kind of circular access, the ability to go in at one end and come out the other. If Effectively. Yeah, I'll maybe another thing here, Paul, but from my own point of view, it was certainly you know, one of the key things that came out of the consultation was that the community wanted to maintain those accesses, uh, you know, both in that kind of circular uh, nature of it, as you as you just described, you know, down commercial lane, but also around, you know, past the, the public toilets and under the bridge and down onto the boulevard. So that, that was quite a key thing that, that came through. Uh, and there was those discussions about the nature of that area, what it was being used for. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just the residents who, who sort of live adjacent to it. There was a, a wider number of groups in the area who, who use it for, you know, immunity use, etc. Uh, and the kind of Comrie Fortnite event that gets held um, was a sort of key thing in that as well. And that was where, we, you know, we had looked at an earlier proposal and then changed that to kind of take account of all that uh, and hopefully to try and address uh, some of the earlier concerns that, that came through in that. Does anyone else want to sort of add to that? Because there was a, quite a lot came out of the, the the sort of exhibition and the, the consultation that we, we did on that. I'll just say a couple of words, Peter, if that's yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think when you look at the design progression for the Comrie flood protection scheme, you can see that, you know, there's been various different iterations. And I have to say the majority of those have been due to the consultation, whether that's the one to one meetings or the wider public consultation events that we've held. So. I think, like Peter said, in it, one of the earlier designs, we had um, ramps yeah. at this mm -hmm. current access point. But actually, the feedback from the local community was that the roads um, to the north of there weren't suitable for wheelchair users, and they'd prefer them to be stepped access. The, the kind of access that you can see just now, and I'm sure you saw that, Paul, when you were there, yeah. there is no pass. Sure. just now really it's just you know it's open grass but you can see the kind of main route of traffic through the the kind of worn away area yeah. so there will be an improvement to that um but I, I think that's the critical part that the design has very much been you know we've tried to develop it based on the feedback that we received from the the landowners but also the the wider community who use that boulevard for common fortnight and and general well-being etc OK, that, that's helpful. Uh, I don't know if it's possible if, 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 to give me a kind of reference to the which paragraph or which section in the full consultation report that's with the uh, scheme papers that deals with that general issue of support for, for access to the boulevard. I found some references to the point that was made there about um, uh, the, 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 the ramps uh, and the concerns that led to the removal from the scheme. But if you give me a reference to where the, it, it stated in that report, um, uh, then that would be useful just as, as to where that kind of support for the circular route and the, the access uh, across the sort of the pathway, the network of pathway, uh, that would be useful as well. Uh, I think 
so when we were reviewing everything um, late, late last week, I remember there being a section in there. So we'll come back to you with the numbers. Yeah, if you come back with the numbers, that would be really helpful, actually, just, just, to, just to reference that. I think um, is it section section three point one point one talks about yeah. the issues with ramps, etc. Paul, yeah. uh, yes. and I don't have to hand. There must be other bits where um, you know the general access to the boulevard was, was sort of raised. I think you're going through my same thought process. I, I found three point one point one about the ramps as well, and I was looking around for the bit that just set out. I mean, I think it is there, and I've seen other documents that that, that kind of support that. But if you have a reference there, that that would be very. Uh, very useful, and and I, I presume that that just at that kind of general level of the circular access and the support that that that, that describes that in essence is the, the the answer to the question as to whether one access, i.e. under the bridge, uh, is insufficient. There needs to be a second one. The bigger question is where it is. Uh, we'll come to in a moment, but presuming that's the answer to the question that one access is insufficient. Just uh, one of the things to mention about the circular access as well, Paul, is that um, you'll notice in the design, Becky mentioned this kind of one area of grass and the, the proposal to improve that. So the plan is to surface that. And one of the reasons to do that is one, yeah. yes, to improve the surface course and the surface treatment for wheelchair users and um, people with buggies and all the rest of it. But the other reason for doing it is to encourage people towards the steps. What actually happens at the moment is some people come down under the bridges you've described and continue to walk along the river bank. Um, yeah. But what they're actually doing there is they're going through private garden ground. So while we can't stop that completely, if we put a, a proper surface path in and direct that to a stepped access, hopefully that's where people are going to be encouraged to go and they'll go back right. onto the lanes and back into the kind of public areas rather than through private gardens in the future. OK, no, that's, that, that's helpful too. Thank you. Okay, that's that, that's that's useful. Um, and, and I mentioned a moment ago about the kind of question as to where that access at the kind of foot of commercial lane or towards Ancaster Lane is, is, is going to be. Uh, and I wonder. I think this is a question probably for, for, for Peter Dixon. Um, I've noticed that um, in one of the emails to the objector. No, we just lost Paul's signal. Sorry, Paul, you've paused. <laughs> Maybe just Wi-Fi. We'll give you a second or two. We might just need a short interval, folks, to get Paul back online. Just bear with us. Oh, I'm getting a message from IT saying Paul's connection might have gone. OK, we'll see what we can do to get Paul back online, but obviously I need a short uh, break just to try and sort that out.
Right, apologies, folks. Hope Paul's back with us. Back with you. I, I, I lost you there. I presume it was just me who disappeared. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Right, okay. That's that case. We'll think we'll back just now. That, that's all fine. Um, the question I was asking was addressed to, to Peter, uh, and it was just on this question about the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the preference of where the stairs should be. Uh, and I'm going to come in a minute to the question of title ownership uh, on that. But um, Peter, in your email of 22nd May uh, 2020 to, um, to the objector, uh, you, you describe a, a kind of technical validation for preferring the access as to where it is. Um, I don't know if you could just summarise what that technical validation is. You, there may be others who may be able to help you with that as well, just so I can understand what the um, the, the 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 reason for the preference. If the if, if the case is made that there needs to be circular access, the question obviously is where the access should be, and the issue I guess is whether you need two stair accesses in, in such close, close proximity. But specifically on your email of twenty second May, I wonder if you just summarise the, the 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 technical validation that was the un, underpinning that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that yeah. Um, I think Swaco really provided us with a, a sort of technical note looking at the, the issues and how how we'd arrived at the the design that had been developed. Um, and it, I think it really came down. We kind of touched on some of the issues already, but it was yeah. the the consultation that had been undertaken. Uh, so we, we'd mentioned uh, discussions with other groups, so that included the Council's Green Space team and access officer, uh, non statutory consultees, including Scotways, local community council uh, and other local recreation and sporting groups. Uh, and all that all sort of all those comments and information that we'd got we'd got from them uh, were fed into the design process. Uh, and that Helped to identify the area in terms of its access uh, and sort of public amenity, uh, so the sort of status that it had, um, and that sort of concluded that the the access to the riverside uh, and the amenity value was, was obviously important to the community, uh, and that maintaining that access to the riverside was really a sort of key factor um, right, in the okay. design. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it was also, I'm trying to just read this quickly, Paul, but. Um, I think the fact that the well existing access is there, so I'll just let you in a second, Becky. The well those existing access is there, which we just felt we really had to maintain rather than, you know, obviously if you're building a flood wall there, there's the potential that you could be extinguishing those accesses. So it was very much felt that given the amenity uh, benefits, etc., and the existing accesses that were already in place, that, that we should really uh, maintain those. Uh, there was a bit of discussion about the disabled access ramp. Um, and obviously that was deleted and the disabled access was provided from uh, under the bridge uh, for the rest. The part, one of the key reasons in that I think was that commercial in itself is private uh, and the condition yeah. of the surface in there etc wasn't great for, for wheelchair users etc. So it was felt that we could provide a better access uh, from the sort of west uh, as you see around the public toilets and under the bridge. Um, I think that was the main reason. Becky, you can maybe help me out here because I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase this uh, technical note. I, th I think that covers most of what I was going to say. I think, Paul, one of your questions was about having two gates and yes. perhaps one of them being lockable. And yeah. that's because that is private ground sure. um, further down. So the, the kind of main access that's completely open to the public and going back to Craig's point about, I suppose, directing uh, people who are using that area over the kind of publicly available ground yeah. um, and, and, and I suppose redirecting them away from heading into people's private ground was the main the main point there and having those lockable gates were kind of required to allow the private landowners access to their gardens which are okay. obviously on the riverbank. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean that 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 that's very helpful. I mean I I found the response to my um. Uh, uh, request on 9th of June um, for further information from all parties very useful. That was uh, Peter's note of 17th of June. And that was useful both because it set out what the respective title position was, but also set out the area of, of land um, both to the east and west of the bridge that's the public amenity space um, uh, that, um, uh, that is maintained. And certainly from what I observed 
when I, I went to see the site, it looks like it, it looked as if there were kind of picnic tables that were and they were actually being used the day that I was there uh, that were behind there and more. And so that was useful um, just to kind of see what is the area. Now, the impression I, I got in, in particular from that note is the land to the rear, certainly there and more, is privately owned, but is regarded as public amenity space. Um, and the, the land as you go further east, which is the land of Homer, then onto the neighbouring land and then beyond that to the rear of Ernside Cottage, the lines uh, East Riverside and, and Newcroft, they're all privately owned, the impression I get, down from the kind of the rear crossing, the, 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 the east and the west running bit of commercial lane right the way down to the river. And so the sense there was that, I don't know how often they're in practice used by members of the public, but they're privately owned bits of land. Uh, I did see when I was there, they're not fenced off, but they're, they're sometimes delineated, bits of it are delineated um, uh, as, as, as area of land. I mean, presumably the majority of public use just now is on the amenity area that's on the plan that Peter's note sent, the, the, the amenity open space recognised, I think, in the local development plan. Most of the public access that there presumably is on those areas, as opposed to the rear of the buildings further to the east. I believe, I believe so, and I think when we were looking at the design, it was to try and make sure we didn't encourage people to start going into that pub, that right, private okay. line. Yeah. Okay, now that, that's useful. Do, do you happen to know how long that amenity ground that's described in the, the note that Peter sent on 17th of June, how long that has effectively been used kind of as amenity land and, and kind of publicly by the, the general population um, of Cumbria? That's a good question, Paul. I'm not sure. I think um, we just get the general place and it's has it always been like that. I don't know if yeah. we can say that, but you know, it's been like established like that for you know for quite some time now. You know, not a long yeah. number of years, I think. Um, yeah. Whether it was kind of it just kind of evolved like that, I suppose. Whether you could point yeah. to a particular date when it yeah. was sort of designated as such, that's yeah. maybe unlikely. But um, I think it's just part of the the kind of background of, uh, of the area, really. Yeah, I mean, I suspect that's probably right. I mean, it, it looks from sort of walking around the area as if that yeah, formally or informally that's been a, a, an area used by residents for some considerable time. But uh, I, I, I was just interested if you, if you happen to know if it's kind of, you know, it's obviously it doesn't look as though it's very recent that started, but whether it's something that's existed for 20 years, 40 years or time immemorial effectively. But um, it, it sounds it, it, just a sort of layout of it suggests it's been the case for some considerable time. But uh, obviously that's not something you might necessarily know. Um, uh, as a matter of kind of history, unless any of you are co come from the town, I guess. <laughs> Paul, yeah, we, we might struggle to point to an exact date when it, you know, became yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, that's all. That's all fine. Okay, that that's useful. Um, and co coming on to the sort of title deed position, because I, I, a couple of things I just wanted to kind of tease out a little bit all of that, but certainly in terms of the the stairs. Um, the steps as they are as they are designed at present. I think your note, uh, Peter, indicated that you, 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 your, your position, the council position, is that the stairs plus also effectively the kind of space at the bottom of each stairs are needed to uh, to, to get onto them. They're all um, located on the certainly on the amenity or public space. Um, that your map shows. It looks reasonably clear from the map that the, you, you sent attached to the document on the 17th of June. The shape of that, the shape of it doesn't exactly match up with title deeds, it doesn't look like, but it looks as if the stairs are, are, are completely in the kind of amenity area uh, that, 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 that's, that's there. I think that's um, that's very much the kind of position um, of, of of the council, and that's why they're located at that particular at that particular site. Um, the reason I was asking those very specific questions, uh, both of you and of the objector, uh, is that one of the things I was kind of puzzling over um, was a, a, a kind of um, toing and froing between the objector and council officials as to um, whether the um, the stairs that space at the bottom and therefore the configuration of the wall at the east side of the, those stairs intrude 
on Fiona Smith's land or not. Um, she says it doesn't. Sure, speaker, she says it does intrude. Uh, and I think your your note that says that that, that it doesn't. Um, so I, I, I was I was just wanting to explore that a little bit just to get, get a better understanding. Obviously, you know, I, I haven't seen received a reply from her in relation to that issue um, before today, uh, but I've seen your note that, that, that indicates the position as far as the, the, the council is, is concerned. Um, the, 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 the question, I guess, and the reason that, uh, that was, was in my mind in all of this is in your note, Peter, of the 17th of June, I think what you indicate as the title ownership position of a homer, uh, I think matches up pretty exactly with the title deed that is with the papers and, and has, has been uh, seen by me uh, for that property. Uh, but you indicate that to the West, the property is owned by Aaron Moore. I suppose my, my question is, and it's a very narrow area of land, but if you look at commercial lane itself, the thing that was in my mind is that if you take the width of commercial lane, taking that from the main road, from Drummond Street down, I suppose my question is, who owns the extension of commercial lane southwards down to the river? Um, uh, I think you've indicated that your, your, your the view of the council is that you take the rear edge line of commercial lane. The reason I was asking the question uh, is it's a, you've indicated already it was a privately owned lane, uh, and what I wasn't sure, and I wasn't sure if this was the, the where the objective was coming from, uh, as to whether um, she claims an ownership, if you like, of an extension of part of the lane. Or whether, whether in fact the whole lane and the extension of it is owned by Aaron Moore, uh, and that that becomes important because actually, if you take the extension of commercial lane all the way down to the river, that does just slice a little bit. I think it's actually it's not the stairs, but the but the the bit at the foot of the stairs, effectively. But I, I don't know what the council's position is on, if you like, on that bit of the extension of commercial lane. Who do you, do you, you may not know the answer to this question, but who who do you think owns that? Yeah, can, yeah. I, can I can I ask your screen, Paul yes, or uh, Bobby? Would that be? I think I might be able to help here. Yeah, it might help just to put the plan up, Paul. Yeah, uh, I've got I've got a wider plan with all the all the titles, so I'll just uh, give me two seconds. Let's hope you can see this. Let me know if that's it's quite a busy kind of land ownership schedule that we've compiled over quite a long period of time. It does look like a complex title ownership position and it may not be possible to finally determine it. So this this uh, this pale green, just where my yeah. cursor is through the middle, that's that's yeah, commercial I'm, lane. I'm, I'm just say sorry, sorry, I'm not seeing anything on screen just now, but all right, all okay. Right. Uh, I can see it, Craig, so maybe it's just take a few seconds to, to yeah, feed right. through. Just let us know when you've when you've got a wee visual Paul if that's okay. Okay, not seeing it just now but I'll, I'll show when I do uh, just double checking, can other people that stand out of Perth and can I see it? Can you guys at Sweco see it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can see it, Craig. Right. All right. Sa sadly, I can't. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Technology. I don't, yeah. Let's see. Craig, maybe if we take a snip of it and put it in the chat. Yep, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. It's uh, quite rough and ready, this, because it has a wee snap. I think it's basically shown uh, the green portion there, Craig, is commercial lane. Uh, yeah. As far as the sort of bottom end of commercial lane is all, all sure. owned by, is that single party, Craig, or is that shared ownership in there? It's single party. It's, it right. seems to be a relic title from yeah. an old estate. Uh, ah, right, so that it doesn't extend down to the riverbank, Paul. Right. Um, yes. Is the sort of key thing of that. Yeah. Er Moore's act, uh, ownership actually, ha uh, you know, covers that that piece of ground. Yeah. So while uh, so, yeah. most of the the property owners to the east, including that Homer, own right down to the riverbank, you can't really extend the, the ownership of commercial lane down that way. Uh, no. So Er Moore owns that a bit okay. of ground to the west and that extended bit of ground below commercial lane itself. Right, okay, that, that makes sense. That does make sense. I mean, it might be useful rather than necessarily dealing with this today, if you could just kind of send it in um, 
uh, to, to our office, then I can, then I can see that. But I understand what you're saying. Uh, obviously, the commercial, the ownership of the ground of the road <clears throat> itself clearly uh, won't extend all the way down to the river. Um, uh, and if Aaron Moore's title didn't have that land, you, then you'd raise the question, who owns who owns the extension of commercial lane? But I think what you're saying is that the, the title ownership position, as you've ascertained it, suggests that it is actually Aaron Moore. Uh, and that's that's obviously very useful to see. So even though I can't say just now, see it just now, don't worry about that. If, you, if you're able to send that in, then I can um, I, 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 I can I can deal with that. And that's that's very helpful just, um, as an explanation of that. Just so you're aware, when I, when I send it in, um, you'll see loads of kind of numbers pointing to different parcels. So it is quite a busy and complicated yeah. drawing, but the, the actual lines are the important okay. thing, I guess. Yeah, indeed so. And I don't worry about that. That's absolutely fine. OK, that's very, that's very helpful. Um, and presumably, I mean, that may be the answer to the question about, about land ownership position. Um, and presumably it, it's possible um, to move the steps and the stairs and everything a little bit to the um, uh, to the west. Um, presumably it's logistically possible, but I'm conscious, of course, by, by doing that, that creates a, a different impact on the owner of Ernmore, who, of course, um, hasn't been consulted about that possibility. But I take it as technically possible to do that if there, if there had been a, a difficulty, so long as the rights of the owners of Ernmore are kind of are protected in doing that. That would be a sweet old question. I, I, think we, I think we could, Paul, yeah. I mean, the the process over that now sort of completed this outline design process yeah. and, and published the scheme, so we sort of fixed it. Um, uh, the, the flood risk management Scotland Act is different to the previous legislation in a way because it previously used to have to set out what was known as sort of li limits of uh, lateral deviation. Right, yes. And when you yeah. publish your scheme, you had to kind of show yeah. um, a bit of kind of a, a sort of tolerance in your scheme. You, you could say, well, well, we'll build that flood wall there, but it'll be within those limits. Uh, and that's what got published. That that kind of went with the, the flood act that we have now, the flood risk management Scotland Act. But I think the flood act's maybe a bit more focused on just that concept consultation so if you were going to move uh, an element of steps and you would just go to the landowner and say well, we're going to move those steps you know yeah. six inches that way whatever it may be is that okay here's, here's some yeah. updated drawings etc and you can then have those uh, individual agreements with those owners so yeah you know we've we'll published the scheme now and hopefully things are, are more or less fixed but yeah we'd like to think there's still a bit of leeway mm. uh, to make those kind of adjustments and what we often find is that as we move into the detailed design process, the engineers are, are designing things and looking at things and saying, that wall's got to be a bit thicker than we allowed for at the design yeah. stage. That, that might be slightly higher, that might be slightly lower. And there's a lot of little adjustments and things. Uh, but what we do as a local authority is we've, we're going to have a, you know, another public exhibition, basically, okay. down the line yeah. a, bit, a little bit. And we'll still have those ongoing one-to-ones with, with individual landowners to discuss those kind of things. Yeah, OK, that's... Uh... That, that's helpful from that from that perspective. A useful sort of the get a kind of understanding of the kind of the the, the framework both of the the previous and the current the current legislation. I'm, I'm familiar with that in, in relation to road schemes, for example, where you get a kind of a a, a, a kind of set of profess and as you say, a sort of limits of deviation within which you can you, you can accommodate things. So that's um, that's kind of that's kind of useful. But certainly, if the, if, if that were uh, contemplated, it's obviously important that, um, as you've said already, that the, 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 there's proper consultation with the the, the owners of Ernmore. It may only be a few inches, but it's something that uh, would have a, a different impact. And they've they've not objected on what they saw, and not on what they've not seen. So that's um, that's useful. Um, I, I think Paul, what I'm just saying as well, because the EIA has assessed the impacts of the design as it stands, there'd probably have to be a bit of a technical note as well, just to okay. confirm that any changes wouldn't result in any significant change to the conclusions of the Okay, right, the that, yeah, that's useful. Yeah. Okay, right, thank you. Okay, thank, thanks for all of that. Uh, now, moving on back to the kind of the, the, the question of, of access, I'm thinking here specifically of the access, although she's not made the point of the objective property itself. Um, 
uh, I think Becky, you you'd made a point about the, um, the 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 access the owners further to the east get to their own private property. Um, if the stairs weren't there, presumably the owners of a homer, uh, I know the current owner isn't objecting, uh, because of the private access issues further to the east, presumably her access without the wall. Uh, having stairs over it, they, she, she too would, would only have access to her property by going under the bridge and along the riverfront. Would, would, is that fair? Yeah. yeah. When you look at the, the plan, you can see that just now, like we were talking about before, there's the kind of path access yes. that goes up and leads to the bottom of the um, commercial road. So without the steps where they'd be proposed, they would also have to go on a rather long detour and under the bridge themselves. Okay, well, that's, that's useful because that was the impression I got is, is effectively without that her own land is kind of landlocked in that sense unless she goes through that, that other means but I just wanted just to check my... I think she would certainly to be severing her own direct access to the, the lower part of her garden ground Paul, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right that's, right that's useful. Okay, moving on from title deeds and access in private land uh, just to deal with just two or three other aspects of the the, the, the objection um, and moving on now to the kind of the question of the height of the wall and the stairs over it and I think there were some points about privacy that were uh, made in relation uh, in relation to that um, and I just I just wondering whether you, you wanted to comment on the, 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 the impact on the immunity of the wall and I'm thinking both about the immunity on the property of Homer but also the property Aaron Moore as well um, from my site visit it looked as if Ern Moor um, where the residential property is kind of is, is nearer the river uh, and I think the stairs are quite close not to the garden ground but I think there's some windows to the rear of the property Ern Moor um, uh, and, and I just wondered if there's anything you wanted to comment about the kind of the the, the fact that somebody might be would be maybe only fleetingly but climbing stairs in order to get over our steps to go over that and therefore have a, a kind of uh, a greater ability to see into into garden grounds both at Homer and, and Ernmore. Uh, what was the council's the council's view on, on, on those issues? <laughs> you maybe touched on some of it already Paul and that if people are, are, are doing the kind of up and over with the steps it's, it's kind of fleeting uh, and they're not going to linger really because it's just viewed as, as being that access to get you down commercially and, and onto the boulevard um, so we didn't feel it was too much of a concern and we did run this past planning uh, again uh, and the council's planner um, come back to that. I think it's been uh, his view is reflected in some of the correspondence we sent to, to Ms Smith that um, in terms of that issue and in terms of the, the sort of planning issues around there they wouldn't see that as, as being a reason for refusal uh, and that that could be you know adequately dealt with uh, by design and that there could be potential ways of screening any sort of overlooking uh, purely by design. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And on that screening point, I mean, it struck me that in one sense, the, um, uh, there's a degree of, of kind of overlooking anyway that takes place from the other side of the river with the Strowan or Strowan Road area there. That's a slightly higher, the impression I get is that the banking is slightly higher at that side. Um, but I don't know, I don't know the extent to which the, there's an overlooking, a degree of kind of over overlooking anyway. Uh, or whether the, the there's some reasonably mature trees that might protect the garden's privacy from across the road, but I don't know if I don't know if that was a factor at all in um, in, in the fact that somebody's walking along the, the 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 roadway at the south end of south side of the river, um, whether that had an impact on on, on questions of, of the privacy of gardens anyway. Um, Paul, I've put a, a snip of the image showing the height of the wall and the steps in its location for context. And I've also got a photo montage that shows that south um, kind of aspect of the riverbank with the houses beyond. Okay. So I'll yeah. include that in the chat as well. Um, these yeah. are all within the LVIA chapter of the EIA if anyone's looking to go in right. okay. and find them on the planning portal. OK, that's that's helpful. Um, and just going on now to the, the there was a range of issues uh, in connection with suggested antisocial behaviour of, 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 of various 
of various nature. Uh, and I just wondered whether you wanted to say anything about the kind of the, the council's response. I know this is recorded in, 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 in the documents already, what the council's view on the concerns that were raised by the objector about the risk of enhanced antisocial behaviour because of the proposals at this site. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think you know, I think we, we sort of acknowledge that in any you know kind of town or village, you, you can get these issues. Um, but I think overall, we felt that it wasn't an issue that the, the scheme itself was was really going to introduce. Um, because again, you've you've got if it's just about the steps themselves and the access down there, you know, you're going to get that. Uh, you're going to actually maintain that through flow of pedestrian traffic. Um, which, in terms of antisocial behaviour, etc., might actually discourage that. And you could up, you could make the, the other argument that if you extinguish that access and you, you didn't put the steps in, you know, you could create a little kind of cubby hole for for people to hang about and kind of loiter. Um, but by keeping the access open, it's, it's going to discourage that in a way. I think. Um, and I think it was also in the discussions about this last week. We kind of felt the walls aren't really high enough. Um, you know, to allow people to kind of hide and and and, and create problems, um, they would have to be kind of crouching down or sitting down really to to really sort of loiter about and, and linger and, and cause any potential problems. So, um, and uh, you know, we just where somebody's objecting to a flood scheme on the grounds of sort of antisocial behaviour, flood schemes aren't. You know, we're here to to try and manage the risk of flooding to the community. Um, and it's not, you know, you don't try and use a flood scheme to try and deal with an antisocial behaviour problem. And the council's got separate uh, means of doing that. And I think in the statement that we submitted, we gave a link to the sort of council's yeah. antisocial behaviour approach, uh, which is on the council's website. So there's, there's other things um, and a, a sort of separate approach can be taken to that uh, within communities. OK, thank you. Um, and, and one of the issues that I'd, I'd sense was a, con a, a, a concern. Now, this may be around construction, which I'll come to just in a second, uh, but kind of the, the usage of, of commercial lane. And I see from the plans that it looks like at the back of the, the property at Homer, uh, there, there's like in a garage, uh, there's something marked on, on one of the plans, um, plan 119. 398 uh, stroke 400 stroke 304 of a reference to, to, to a garage. Um, as, as far as you're aware, are, are concerns about, are, are, are some of the concerns of the objector about um, blocking the, the access or parking in such a way that would block access to that garage? I think so. I think, I think Ms Smith uh, runs a business. I think it's up in Put Lockery actually, but um, She's not confirmed to me directly, but I have a funny feeling it's this is used as um, storage, obviously for her house and potentially for her business. So she just wants to make sure that she can get access to that as and when required. Um, we've tried to reassure her on points like that with um, talking about during the construction phase about how we'll manage parking and vehicle movements and all that will be quite tightly controlled by a construction environmental management plan, which uh, the contractor will, will develop and liaison with ourselves, SWECO, the planning department and various other parties um, and that all needs to be agreed before they, before they break ground. Um, so we will try and maintain access to that as, as best as possible during construction. There will be limited disruption I'm, I'm sure, um, but as ever there will be, there'll be guys on site and there will be phone numbers and it will be like, I need access on this day. We can, we can certainly sort things like that. In terms of permanent loss and parking in front of it, um, nobody really parks there at the moment. I think that's one of the reasons when you were on site, you know, it's miss miss, but plant pots. Um, I think we've lost Paul again. Yeah, Paul's away. Hold that thought, Craig, for now. <laughs> hold that. Yeah, I don't know where I, I don't know where he got to. <laughs> See if we can get it back in. We'll wait for him to rejoin. Yeah, I'll just have a pause just now, folks. We'll get back as soon as we can.
And hopefully Paul's back with us. Hi, Paul. I seem to be as for that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> technology. technology. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I think I lost you when 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 Craig was just uh, finalising his answer. I think about the access to the garage. Yeah, I'm not sure where we where we got to, Paul. Yeah. But I was just saying that um, there's likely going to be some temporary disruption, certainly with access right. to the garage. Yeah. But we'll be able to manage that once we yes. get to the site. Um, yeah. And from a permanent point of view. We've seen uh, Miss Smith has got plant pots at the moment at the boundary of our. Right. Oh, I see, right, right. Okay. And I think that's partly to do their parking. Um, yeah. So obviously we will have a, the proposal is to have a flood wall along there. So hopefully um, that acts as a bit more of a robust deterrent than, than the plant pots and stops people yeah. blocking the lane off. OK, yeah. No, that's... Um... That's helpful. In fact, that actually might be a convenient sort of into the, the kind of next set of questions I've got in relation to the construction implications. Um, and I think she raised some concerns both on disruption um, during construction, but also an issue about the worries about the chronology uh, of, of construction arrangements. Um, again, making the point that the Strowan Road side um, is perhaps higher land and, and that a concern that because of the order in which things might be construction might be carried out, um, was wanting assurances that that, that would minimise the risk of construct of of, of 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 flooding, uh, both disruption during construction and and and, and flooding, um, and I see that uh, the uh, the intention is to have a a, a construction uh, management plan. Uh, in place that will be developed in, in, in the period ahead. And I was wondering whether you wanted to see a little bit more about that and in particular the steps that you take to kind of consult with, with residents in particular uh, so that they are kind of kept fully informed as to the development of that. Yeah, I think yeah. in terms of traffic, Paul, there's almost two sides to it. One is, um, is the sort of permanent uh you know condition and what happens with commercial lane etc uh, and we don't feel that they're really longer term once the scheme's in uh, and constructed and you know we, we want to return the village to, to its residents and let them yeah. uh, get on peacefully as before so we don't don't feel there's any long term uh, implications for, for traffic uh certainly acknowledge that in the short term when we've got the construction works going on that there, there could be those impacts and that's where um you know craig's already mentioned the construction environmental management plan is one of the key things that we'll, we'll bring forward uh, to try and address all those risks um and there's there's it's difficult in that area because we've got the three lanes there's um commercial lane and castle lane uh, is it man's lane whatever the third one is i forget the name now but it, it, we've got three quite tight accesses uh, and you know we've got to get down to the bottom of those lanes to construct a flood wall um so what, what we'll have to do is, is try and sort of use the three accesses as best we can uh, and i think Ms. smith has said things like you know could there be a one-way system set up temporary during construction works that you know that may come out of the construction environmental management plan um but i think what, what we need to do is uh, and we've got um contractors on board already giving us advice and, and looking at these issues uh, through a sort of early contractor involvement uh, phase that we're working on um and you know we can get the contractor to, to look at these things uh, yeah. and some of those issues around that and what we'll do is start getting that plan together and then just go back to residents as, as we already said it might be on a one-to-one yeah. -one basis but certainly um you know we'll have a sort of other community drop-in events as we call them or okay. public exhibition type events we'll say Here, here's the detailed design now folks you know we've got a bit more detail to come and talk to you about and, uh, and then I, th I think at those kind of meetings that's where those uh, concerns will come out about uh, construction, traffic, noise, vibration, all those things that people will be concerned about, and that's what we'll have to try and address those. So there's, yeah, certainly be further consultation with the community on that, uh, Paul, before no, we that, break down. Yeah. Peter, okay. is, it worth, is it worth just saying as well that an outline construction environmental management plan was submitted with all of yes. the various different EIA and, and flood order documents. So that took into account all of the mitigation that was recommended as part of the EIA. So the view was that that's almost a starter for 10 and then the appointed contractor will take that and, uh, and kind of develop it and, and add the detail that we're talking about following that consultation. 
I think it, it, Paul, it's all it's all worth uh, noting as well in, in relation to the construction sequence and the chronology and and the flood risk during that period. It's it's worth noting at the moment that that's very much at the forefront of both the contractor mind that Peter mentioned and also you know our team, particularly the flood modelers. So. Our flood modeler who done the flood modeling for this project has been working very closely with the contractors planner and programmer to make sure that he understands the order, the specific order in which the scheme should be constructed to to minimize that risk as far as possible. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. OK, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and my sort of last set of questions were just just on the kind of um, some points that are made by the the objector. I wanted just to give you an opportunity to kind of comment on them, and that's on the kind of the, the levels of communications and various things that have taken place uh, over over the piece. Um, uh, I've got a kind of specific question, but I just um, just sort of, sort of generally uh, wonder wonder whether you wanted to say anything about the kind of the sense um, the the suggestions that. Um, I think initially around the ramp, which has now been addressed, um, there, there have been suggestions that communication hasn't hasn't been as as, as good as it could have been, and the the objectors felt misled in various respects. But I've seen some of the responses to that. But I just wondered whether there was anything you wanted to say specifically um, on on that point. Yeah, I'll start. Yeah. I mean, we we um, you know we do put quite a lot of effort into projects like this, and I think as Becky maybe said earlier on, this has been uh, community led, has been consultation focused um, and a lot of the design solutions have been developed in liaison and in consultation with, with local residents and, and interest groups etc. Uh, so that's been quite a key part of it uh, and I think at the, in the introduction I gave, you know, sort of give a flavour of the kind of one-to-one -one meetings we, that we've had, uh, we've been hopefully very open with the community and providing a, a dedicated web page for the, the flood scheme, putting all the documents up there. Um, there's been sort of reasonably regular newsletters uh, around the whole community, as well as a sort of reasonable amount of one-to-one um, -one correspondence with individual landowners and interest groups as well, putting proposals to them, getting comments back in. And then that's all gone through the, uh, the public exhibitions that we've had. And then we've tried to kind of um, close out the consultation loop as it, as it were by the public consultation reports which have also gone online so hopefully people can see that we've listened to the views and taken account of the views by amending the scheme proposals wherever mm. we can uh, and that's gone through there i think there was a meeting with miss smith um march 2019 i think yep. about a month before that uh, public exhibition um, and I know she wasn't that happy, but necessarily how it was minuted, etc. Um, but it, you know, it can be difficult because staff, without you know, speaking to a lot of people, there's a lot of issues coming up. We do, do try and minute these as best we can, uh, but it's difficult sometimes to, to write everything down. Um, sometimes your minutes can be a little mm -hmm. bit better. Uh, but that that's why you know we had those individual uh, discussions. We have a lot of information on the website, and then the opportunity to come to the public exhibitions there. We did write to Miss Smith to say, you know, there's yeah. a public exhibition getting held. Uh, I don't think she attended, unfortunately. No, I got um, she's unable to attend, and she's yeah. got an explanation for that. And I totally understand. Well, uh, but I think we just made the point that if she had been able to attend a bit earlier on, we could have maybe have had that one to one discussion uh, yeah. further to the previous discussion and tried to sort of address her concerns at an early stage in this process. Um, she did have a bit of a concern that um, there was a comment about drawings not being updated for the uh, the public exhibition. Well, there was about a month between the, the one to one meeting with her and the public exhibition itself. And there just wasn't time really to um, you know gather everybody's comments together, revise the, 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 the scheme drawings at that point and then prepare for the public exhibition, which is quite involved in terms of uh, the display boards and, and all the rest of it yeah. and get ourselves ready for that. Um, so it just wasn't quite enough time to do that. But I, th I think what we did by following up on the exhibition, publishing the public consultation report and the revised drawings online uh, around about November 19, which is still a couple of months before we published the final scheme, we were kind of hoping that that would show the community that you know, we'd sort of listened, amended proposals and then shared the proposals. Um, so there was 
we, we think you know adequate opportunity for people to look at th even if they couldn't make it to exhibitions etc there was enough information there online and there was enough information in the public consultation report that we published to sort of allay concerns etc and there's all the doors always open if, if residents interest groups etc want to speak to the council uh, you know we've had the dedicated web page and we've had a, 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 a corn flood scheme email address set up uh, you know that people can always contact us to, to discuss any further concerns okay thank you i think uh, uh, just on that point um we oh sorry somebody's trying to ring me i'll just stop that <laughs> <laughs> sorry um that comment peter mentioned about people going to meet miss smith in march 2019 and acknowledging at that point that the drawings would wouldn't be able to change for the public consultation. The reason that came about is we'd, we'd met with quite a few of the individual landowners in that area. We were doing it in kind of blocks and we realised quite quickly that the ramp proposal was, <laughs> wasn't popular, I think it's fair yeah. to say. So we knew before going to the public exhibition events that, OK, we're going to show this, but it's not well liked, so we're going to need to change it. And that, that was brought through again in the public consultation and uh, those exhibition events that that theme if you like of we need to get rid of this ramp and and change that um a, a wee bit um aye, we've, we've done a lot of work so it's disappointing when anybody doesn't doesn't like what we've yeah. done but i suppose there's an acknowledgement that you can't keep everybody happy all the time um from our end although we do try <laughs> I, th I think what Craig's also kind of alluded to the fact that the discussion has to start, start somewhere, Paul, and even if we have a proposal, we think that this might not be that popular. You know, we had a technical proposal for ramps, etc., which kind of met, ticked all the boxes in terms of access requirements, etc., at that time. Uh, and you have to start the conversation somewhere. You have to have a proposal to put to people so they can discuss it and they can either like it or, or dislike it at that stage. And that's kind of where we were at that point, really. Um, but you know, hopefully through the documentation, uh, you know, sort of demonstrated that we've, we've amended things to take account of uh, the views raised at consultation uh, as best we could. Okay. Thank, 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 thank you for that. Um, those are all the questions I had. Um, as I said at the start of this call, I, I've been on site um, on 22nd May uh, and, saw, and saw the site. I'm not planning on having a further um, site inspection unless um, the, the Council think that I'd, I'd have a benefit for me in, in doing so. Um, and so my intention is to, um, uh, to, to, to proceed to write, write my report. But in closing this, this, this discussion, two things. Uh, first of all, um, I'd give an opportunity to um, officials from the council or, or SWACO if there's any questions you have for me uh, and also if you want to and you shouldn't feel obliged to if there is anything you wanted to see where we have kind of final or closing sort of drawing together the, the arguments this is this is your chance to do so but as I say um, if, if anybody has any questions for me then now's the time to ask them and I'll say a little bit about kind of in a bit more detail about next process from my perspective. Maybe, maybe not a question, Paul, but uh, just a, a further point to make. Uh, it was something that came up in our discussions last week um, about the access over the flood wall at the, the bottom end, the commercial lane. You know, if we didn't provide something there, there the becomes a little bit of a health and safety issue as well with um, you know members of the public, etc., being on the riverside if we do have a flood event. Uh, at the moment, what under the current proposal would be a couple of couple of ways of getting off the riverside quickly. The best one being obviously those steps that they were proposing to put in. So I think there would be a slight concern there if we didn't get the steps in, uh, that might introduce a bit of a health and safety concern, uh, you know, during flood events, because that area will flood. Um, that's part I mean, of our I, concerns. Yeah, just actually, actually on that specific point, I, I, I noticed that the, the, the double um, double stairs at the back of the lines and and uh, East Riverside are obviously the the reason the reason that's a double compared to this being a single is because of the the access situation. <clears throat> and I see uh, in your note of seventeenth June you refer to them as lockable gates. I mean, you can never tell the future, and that they haven't been built yet. But I mean, do you have any sense? 
uh, at all as to whether they, they're likely to be locked or whether they just have capacity to be locked, because that, that plays into the point you made about health and safety, uh, is that it's, it's, it's it, you know, the, the, there is access over those stairs, but the accessibility to that is obviously impeded if the owners choose to lock them in protection of their private rights. Presumably that, that kind of plays into your point you make about health and safety. Um, I, I say if, if the gates were actually locked, but I don't know if you have any sense, you, it's probably hard, it's probably impossible to say because it, and you, we can't see now because things are not built yet. Um, but I suppose there's an issue there around those that, that other alternative. <clears throat> Yeah, I think the, the intention is that they will be locked because of the, the private access issue, uh, as you've alluded to, Paul. Yeah, um, yeah, but we think, you know, acknowledging that uh, uh, as the proposals currently stand, there's alternative access routes to the riverside, one of them being hopefully uh, at the lower end of commercial lane. Uh, so we feel that's addressed for the time being, but if, you know, we weren't to get the, the access through the bottom of commercial lane that might give us a bit of a concern in terms of health and safety because of those other lockable gates yeah exactly okay it, All right. it goes yes goes back to that point as well we're going to try and uh, although we can't stop people um continuing on along the riverside towards the private properties um we'll certainly try and encourage people back towards the steps or commercial lane um so that'll be done through obviously putting the surface treatment in surface and that footpath to make it a formal link if you like and we'll probably put some planting in as well just to try and prevent people jumping over if you like and onto this private ground down towards yeah. um, these other areas. Okay that's, that's helpful thank you. Anything else? I don't think we've got any further questions Paul we've obviously got I've got some scribbles here, maybe four or five things, bits of further information where I need to confirm to you or yeah. get over to you. Uh, so we'll yeah. give them in and get that information. That's fine. You do that as soon as you can. That, that'll be fine. Yeah. That'll assist me in, in, in doing report writing. And for anybody who is, is watching on the, on the, the, the web stream, um, my next step is then to prepare a report for the council. Uh, and I um, my recommendations will be either to confirm uh, the scheme as it stands just now or to confirm with modifications or to diffuse to confirm the scheme and that then goes I think to council um, at some point to consider whether the approach to their preliminary decision that was made in, in, in June of last year whether they confirm that in light of the the, the report that um, uh, I'll be submitting uh, and my intention is to, to be submitting that report within the next three or four weeks uh, so that council can um, can then consider it in, 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 in a time scale uh, that um, uh, is, is, is helpful to that so that's the sort of that that's kind of the next step from from my perspective um, and and obviously from the council's so any information, Peter, that you have, the sooner, the sooner you can get that to me, the sooner I'll be able to uh, to complete that bit of the process and, and, and submit my report. But uh, unless anybody has any other further questions, I think that's all I have. Uh, so thanks thanks to you all, uh, including for the IT, which which worked reasonably well. We almost got there, uh, a couple of different options. But I'm grateful to your, your IT teams for facilitating this. And I'll now um, draw this meeting to a close. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everyone.